I would now like to introduce Andy Norden, who is a consultant gynaecologist, past president of the British Gynaecological Cancer Society and chair of the Pilot Ovarian Cancer Audit Feasibility Study. Over to you, Andy. Yes, thank yep. you. Brilliant. Please let me know if they don't turn over, because when it starts like this, I've had a few disasters previously. So, uh, yeah, um, Daga, thank you very much for the opportunity of, uh, of joining your first virtual uh, conference. Um, it's fantastic to, to get this up and running, and, and we're obviously in the clinical community really keen to support it. So I'm here to talk about um, uh, ovarian cancer data and uh, ovarian cancer audits. Um, and I guess I, I, I'm, I'm here because for two reasons. Firstly, I was the president of the BGCS just prior to Suda, and um, <clears throat> I have a, a one day a fortnight job with NCRAS, which is the National Cancer Registration Analysis Service. And within those two roles, and when I was coming up towards my um, time as president of the BGCS, um, we, we'd spent as a community probably uh, over a decade along with the charities campaigning for an ovarian cancer audit. Um, unsuccessfully, <clears throat> and there are um, cancer national cancer audits in in a number of other tumor sites, uh, prostate, breast, lung, uh, upper you know, gastrointestinal, etc. And we couldn't really understand why ovary had missed out, but we we put another try in, and we and uh, were were sort of knocked back. So as a um, in a way of trying to highlight the need for an audit and the potential benefit that we could gain from an audit and how valuable it could be in terms of improving um, care across the country, we formed a collaboration between the British Gynaecology Cancer Society and Target Ovarian Cancer and Ovarian Cancer Action and working with NCRAS, which was at that time part of Public Health England, now part of NHS Digital, we, we formed an alliance and set up a, a pilot, an, a, an audit pilot. Now, I'm just moving on to the next slide. Can you see that now? A nod, Alex, yep. Yeah, good. So um, the whole idea of this audit, because all national audits are very expensive, and the whole idea of, of our feasibility pilot was to see how much really useful information we could get from the from the data which is already being collected. Massive amounts of data is collected in the NHS and certainly in cancer. And we um, for for over a decade we've been collecting a data set called the National Outcomes and Services Data Set or COSD. And COSD collects data on every cancer that is discussed and diagnosed in a multidisciplinary meeting or MDT as I'll call them. Um, some of that data needs to be specifically collected and captured by the MDT. Some of it's automatically captured by the, by the um, IT systems in the hospitals. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have massive amounts of information on how uh, people with cancer are diagnosed. Uh, and that all comes from uh, what we call the cancer waiting times uh, data set, which captures patients who are referred up with suspected cancers on the two week wait rapid access pathways. Um, in England, every uh, every dose of chemotherapy that's given now is captured on a automatically captured on a chemotherapy data set called SACT. And then hospitals collect massive amounts of data. Some of it's for, for um, uh, costing and, and financing purposes, but a massive amount of data called hospital episode statistics or HES. And by um, because every individual in the UK has an NHS number, by linking uh, all of these data sets together by NHS number, we could put together, we thought, a, a really interesting picture of, of what's happening in terms of cancer diagnosis and treatment. And, and we wanted to see whether that the information that would be reliable and valid and would give us enough information to be able to initiate change and improvement in care without the, the, the massive burden of standalone separate data sets and, and, and audits. So um, um, this is the, the, most of the stuff that has come out of this audit, and this is a project which is still ongoing, as I'll explain in a minute, but most of the stuff that's come out of this is, is in, the most important stuff is in, in major reports. And these reports are, are publicly available. Uh, so if you just, this, the, the link is there on the, on the slide on the left-hand side, but if you just remember Gyne Cancer Hub, H-U-B, or N-C-I-N, Gyne Cancer Hub, if you, link, if you search that on Google, it'll bring you to this page and you can download the reports. And I'm going to take you through some of the sort of highlights from those reports and try and help you understand how you would understand the slide, the graphs and things. The, uh, there's also a lot more 
really detailed granular data that is available to us as clinical teams on a separate website called Cancer Stats 2. You have to be part of the NHS for that. Um, but that gives us access to much to information which I guess is closer to patient level and will be more uh, confidential, but it helps us understand as, as cancer teams how we're managing patients and how we vary to other, compared to other parts of the country. So this is just a few examples. This is the first report that came out was what we called the disease profile report. And that looked at women in England, only England. I should say we could only do this for England at the moment because the, the, the data sets are sort of specific for England, but we are hoping that this, can, this model can be expanded across the country. So um, th this, this looks at women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer and that it, we would include in that uh, fallopian tube cancer and primary peritoneal cancer. So that's all of those, those diagnoses, 2015-2017. Uh, and this is um, a, a mortality graph. This basically um, looks at uh, deaths from ovarian type cancer during that period. And I'm going to explain to you how funnel plots work, because if you, if you can understand a funnel plot, then you'll be able to understand most of the other graphs. So um, each one of these little dots represents the CCG, Clinical Commissioning Group. So it's a group of patients, a group of patients managed by primary care general practices. The line that goes across the middle is basically the average. And these two dotted lines are what we call standard deviations or, or confidence intervals. So if you're essentially, if you're, if, if you're outside of that area of the graph, then you would be an outlier. The chance of the, those differences happening by chance is extremely small. It's a bit less um, likely here, and, it's, and if you're in the middle of the graph, then you're basically considered to be within the, the average. And, you, and the, the, the x-axis is population, so the further you are down to the right-hand end of the graph, the larger the groups of patients. So these CCGs here have, have got very large populations and therefore the confidence intervals are less because there's less variation by, by random chance, if that makes sense. So most of our data is presented in these funnel plots. Uh, and this just shows that there's actually a, a mortality from ovarian cancer relates to, um, to uh, incidence. And so that's how many cases there are and also how long women will survive with the disease or how many women will die from the disease, uh, the proportion of those women. So you can see there's actually quite a big range across the country. And that be is because there'll be variations around the country in all sorts of things like age distribution of populations and uh, ethnicity of populations and the general health of populations and all those sorts of things. That all goes into the mix. The main graph on the profile report was really looking at survival. And we, we looked at this by Cancer Alliance. And I think there's 19 Cancer Alliances around England. And so each of these um, Cancer alliances are very large areas, and they might have somewhere between two and four gynecological specialist gynec cancer centers within the alliance. Um, and of course, massive variations in types of population in those in those geographies. And the green is a one year survival and the, five, the blue is five year survival. And this is completely all overall, all of the patients diagnosed. And you can see there's quite a range between 62 and 75% in one year survival uh, and 28 to 49% in five year survival. So that was the first thing that made us think, that's really interesting. You know, there are there are big differences in survival around the country, and I guess if you if if you if you start off with that point, then you can start to think, well, what are the differences? Um, what might be the underlying causes of that? Are there differences in referral patterns? Are there differences in access to care? Are there differences in the practices of the centres? Are there differences in treatment with surgery and chemotherapy, and all of those sorts of things? And this is the value, I guess, of a national audit, including every patient who's diagnosed. So our second report was uh, looking at treatment, um, and this this was much more challenging from a from a sort of technical perspective, and it's probably the most exciting part of the project, really, certainly so far. And so we've looked at at women diagnosed with ovarian cancer, 2016 to 2018, and we've got a total of 17,155 women. So it's a big, big group. And, and most countries can't do this sort of analysis because they don't have the the data sets that we do, and don't have an integrated system like we do over in the UK. And we broke those, all of those women down into five categories. Those that didn't get any surgery or chemotherapy for ovarian cancer, that means they didn't, not, doesn't mean they didn't necessarily get any treatment, but they didn't have any, any anti-cancer treatment in terms of a, an operation to remove cancer or chemotherapy to treat the cancer. And that's about a fifth of them overall. Those who had surgery with backup chemotherapy, about a quarter, 25%. Those who had chemotherapy followed by surgery, 18 percent 
Those who got chemotherapy but didn't get an operation, again, 18%. And those that had surgery but no chemotherapy, those who didn't need any chemotherapy after their operation, 16%. And we did lots of different analyses. And if you want to download the, the report, you can read all of this. Um, <clears throat> it's freely available on the internet, as I said. But I'm just looking at one issue here, which is one of the most important issues that we've got, and that's treatment by age group. So in this, we've broken down those treatment groups. And across here, we've got the different age categories, up to 30 in the 30s, in the 40s. Oh, oh sorry. In the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And you can see that the group in where, I don't know whether that's brown or red because I'm half colorblind, but that, that block there at the top, they're, they're the ones who didn't get any surgery or any chemotherapy. And you can see that as women get older, the chance of them not getting any surgery or chemotherapy goes, rises dramatically, particularly over the age of 80. Now, that doesn't mean that doctors are, are ageist. It doesn't mean that, um, that we don't want to treat people because they're old. It may be that some of those women didn't want to have any treatment. They might have said, look, I really don't want to have chemotherapy at my age or whatever. But it's see, a lot of the other work we've done suggests that the reason for that is that these women particularly present to us when they're diagnosed too unwell to be able to have any surgery or to be able to have any chemotherapy. And that's the, the, the recurring theme that you'll see in these slides is the challenge of, of women being diagnosed when they're just too unwell to be able to have any treatment. In other words, they're being diagnosed too late in the pathway. And that's particularly a problem for, for elderly women in, in England. So then we took if you look at the, the treatment of women who have what we call stage one disease, where the disease is just confined to the ovary, they don't have any disease spread anywhere else, there's not a great deal of variation around the country. We excluded those and we just took everyone else. And that's now down to just under 14,000 women. And we again broke them down into these categories. And you can see now, no, no surgery or chemotherapy, that's a quarter, 26% of women with advanced stage disease don't get any treatment. Um, and then if we look at those that had surgery first, then chemotherapy or chemotherapy first and surgery, they're almost exactly the same, about 20% each. But then there's another 22% here who have chemotherapy, but didn't get an operation. And the question is, well, would, you know, does that really matter? How, how, how significant is an operation? And to, if we're going to be doing these analyses, of course, we need to try and make sure that we're looking at like with like, we're comparing apples and apples, not apples and oranges. And so the, the um, statisticians can do these really clever adjustments. So they can make adjustments for different factors. So we, we did these analyses in three different models. First one, we just did the, the raw data. These are just what happened to the patients in each center or in each alliance. Model two adjusted for the age of the patients and the type of cancer they had and the stage of the disease when they were diagnosed. So if in case that if in some places they were presenting, uh, if we had more old, old women, for example, then it would, it would adjust for that. And then the third model, we also added income deprivation, which we can do in England by postcode. They know sort of average post, uh, household incomes by postcode and a thing called a Charleston comorbidity score. And a comorbidity score is, in a, is, a, is a way of trying to understand um, how much other illness uh, a person has, not just the disease that they're being diagnosed with. We really wanted to look at a thing called performance status. World Health Organization performance status gives us a much better idea of really how unwell or how well someone is at the time of being diagnosed with the disease. But we didn't have, at that point, we didn't have enough um, data collected to be able to do that properly. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So now there's a whole load of funnel plots again, and you can forget about the ones on the left because these are unadjusted, but the ones on the right are maximally adjusted. So these, these are uh, adjusting for all the factors that we were talking about there. And this is treatment or no treatment, looking at all the different cancer alliances. Each cancer alliance is a dot. The ones down the right-hand end are bigger populations. The ones on the left-hand end are smaller. And again, we've got a confidence interval. So the, the bit to be looking for are alliances that are down here where there's less or up there where there, there is more than the average and everyone within those dots you could be considered to be within the average and you can see that there's really quite a spread there's a lot of variation around the country in access to any treatment that is surgery or chemotherapy and when we look at surgery it's even more marked so it appears that in some parts of the country 
a much higher proportion of women are getting an operation for ovarian cancer than in other parts of the country. 10% above the average in the best and maybe 15% below the average in the worst. And that's fully adjusted data. But if you look at chemotherapy, there's actually a lot less variation. So, you know, it seems that the ch that doesn't really matter so much, you know, which system you've come through, what part of the country you've come through, you'll still, you probably have similar sorts of chances of getting chemotherapy. Uh, and this is just for, for our interest, really, because there are different ways of, of uh, attacking ovarian cancer with chemotherapy first or with surgery first. And this is looking at the proportion, it's about average around the country, but there, apart from one alliance, there was no real variation in that across the country. <clears throat> and then when we, and there are different populations, so statistically, this is not actually an accurate thing to do. But if you look at the areas in a country that have lots of treatment, particularly higher rates of surgery, they also tend to have improved five-year survival. And we can just look at that in a bit more, in, in, in another way, these, these are correlation graphs. Without getting too technical, I'm not very clever at this, but if you, <clears throat> the R squared is, is, the, is the, um, the, the tightness of the correlation between the two factors. So we've got one year survival here, and then we've got the probability of treatment. So this is a uh, one year probability of, of any treatment and that uh, an R, R squared of 0.68 is pretty strong. So there's a fairly high correlation. If you getting treatment, there's a, whether it's chemotherapy or surgery, you, you've got a much higher chance of, of surviving one year. And that's common sense, I guess, because if you're really unwell when you're diagnosed and you're not well enough to have any chemotherapy or surgery, then you probably wouldn't, we wouldn't expect you to do very well. And I guess that, that that's sadly the situation for a lot of women, particularly those elderly women. If we look at chemotherapy, again, the correlation for one year survival is pretty strong and surgery is very almost exactly the same. So one year survival correlates um, with, with access to treatment fairly tightly. If we look at five year survival, <coughs> Um, any treatment, it's, it's a much less strong correlation. See, the, the, the line doesn't really fit. It sort of jags all over the place. It's only 0.48. So the, the, access, the, the correlation between any treatment and five-year survival is not so strong. And chemotherapy, it's really not strong at all. But with surgery, it's still quite tight. It's, it's over 0.5. So the, it does seem like the, the women who are um, most likely to do well and survive five years and 10 years and all the rest of it beyond that have have had surgery and but partic particularly have had surgery uh, as part of their treatment. Now, that may well be because these women are fitter and healthier when they are, are diagnosed and are able to cope with the surgery. It may be that the type of cancers that they're presented with are more likely to be suitable for surgery and also, also more likely to have a good prognosis. We, it's, we're not, it, that, we're not, we don't know those things yet, but it starts to give us some interesting information. Now, there's the next report that's going to come out is going to be really interesting because we're focusing on, on the first 12 months the women who are diagnosed and survive more than a year and those who survive less than a year. And we're looking at lots of different things and I'd love to show you lots of data from that, but we can't because we haven't published it yet and it's still all provisional, but I, I am just broken the rules just to show you this one. This is the performance status. Um, and performance status, as I was saying before, is probably the most important uh, factor in terms of someone's fitness to be able to cope with treatment, how fit they are, how much they're able to do. Performance status is zero, you're completely fit and well performance status of one, your activities are a bit limited, performance status four, you can barely get out of bed or you can't get out of bed. And if you look again, um, this is diagnosis um, to two months. So these are survive more than a year is the, is the cream bit at the bottom, survive less than two months is the, is the red brown bit at the top. And you can see that as performance status goes up, um, survival really, really goes down. And so the bottom line is, I think that we, if we can get the diagnose that the cancer diagnosed earlier, not necessarily at only a stage, but an earlier time when women are still much healthier, then we're going to be much much better at getting them into treatment and getting them uh, a, a good prognosis. And we know that the women who do badly are very often those who aren't diagnosed with the disease until they've ended up in accident emergency as with being really unwell with their disease. And then it's very much more difficult to get them under treatment. So that's our that's our audit. Um, we've got the, the short-term mortality report. Hopefully we'll be out probably very early in the new year. We've extended by another year and I'm really grateful to uh, Target and the, and the other uh, funders for, for supporting us for a further year and we're going to see how much we can understand about operations, the differences in, 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 in surgery that's done around the country in the last year. 
Uh, but the really good news is that I think because of the, the prominence of, of ovarian cancer and the value of this audit that we've already been able to demonstrate, um, HQIP, which is the, the national audit organization part of the NHS, has, has, has announced during earlier this year that, that it is going to, to fund a national ovarian cancer audit. Uh, it's going to take a few years to get up and running but we very much want to be involved in what they call the scoping process so they can de develop the audit and then hopefully the BGCS and the charities will be involved in a group that will actually be administering and running that audit you know indefinitely into the future. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you Andy that's extremely informative absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, so, yes, I'd like to now introduce Rachel Downing, who is Head of Policy and Campaigns at Target Ovarian Cancer, who will be sharing updates from our work to ensure everyone receives excellence in their care. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm just going to, hopefully my slides are working. I've been lucky um, and everyone can see that. Alex, give you a thumbs up. Wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really pleased um, to be talking to you today. Um, about, so I'm going to give you a sort of whistle stop tour, if you like, of all the areas that we're working on, um, where we think we can have some impact and ensure that every woman diagnosed with ovarian cancer has access to that excellent care. Um, and there are five areas I'm going to touch on. And the first one, um, which will come as hopefully no surprise to anyone, is um, symptoms awareness campaigns. This is something we've talked um, a lot about today already, um, but we know that symptoms awareness is a really vital tool in getting people diagnosed at a much earlier stage and as quickly as possible. So we know currently just a third of women are diagnosed at that early stage, and we know that we've got a bit of a gap on symptoms awareness. So just 20% of women across the UK could name bloating as a symptom of ovarian cancer. And this is an area where we can have a little bit of a celebration because we have had some fantastic successes. Um, in November 2020, the NHS in England for the very first time uh, had a nationwide symptoms campaign that featured bloating, a key symptom of ovarian cancer, and you can see that imagery on the left there. Um, that campaign was retooled um, in August this year and bloating became abdominal discomfort, um, which was great for us because that also meant it now included the symptoms of tummy pain and early satiety. Um, but we're not done in England. Um, we know that we need to see this investment sustained. This isn't the sort of thing that you can do once and then expect to see results. So we're going to be keeping up our campaigning work to make sure that that investment continues. And it's something that the NHS does that's wrote more than a sort of special one off. We've not been as successful yet in the other nations of the UK. We have had some limited success in Scotland. And um, the image on the right there is a still from a video that one of our superstar campaigners, Rona, did with her daughter Michaela talking about her experience of diagnosis um, which was put together by the NHS in Scotland and featured the symptoms but again we've not seen that sustained level of investment. Um, Wales and Northern Ireland are tiptoeing towards symptoms awareness. These a draft cancer strategy in Northern Ireland which commits to and acknowledges there is a problem with generally symptoms awareness across Northern Ireland and we're working really hard to make sure that ovarian cancer is up there for those cancers that need that investment. Um, and in Wales, we're partnering with the Women's Institute. Um, so some of you may know that the WI this year have chosen ovarian cancer symptoms awareness as their campaign focus for the year. Um, so in Wales, we're going to be partnering with them on an event um, to take the need for symptoms awareness to members of the Welsh Assembly. Um, so if you're in Wales, um, keep an eye out for more details about that soon. The second thing we want to see is that a diagnosis happens as quickly as possible. So Andy um, touched on his presentation about some of the outcomes of that later diagnosis. Um, and there is one very clear ask we have here, which is around the diagnostic pathway. So this diagram, which might be a bit small, um, but I'll talk you through it, shows um, the differences in the pathway. So if you live in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and you experience symptoms, you will go to your GP. You will have a co one 2 5 blood test. If that is raised, then you'll be sent for an ultrasound. And if that shows ovarian cancer, then there's an urgent referral made um, to specialist secondary cancer care. In Scotland, the CO125 and the ultrasound is ordered at the same time. So there's no need to wait for that blood test result to come back. And that's really key for two reasons. The first, um, just the time that it takes. If you're doing both tests together, you're cutting out that time and waiting for results to come back and then ordering another test and waiting for that. But we also know that a CO125 is a bit of an imperfect test. Um, I'm sure there'll be some of you on the call today who never had a race CO125. Um, and we also know it's not always super accurate in picking up early stage disease. 
So we are advocating for this belt and braces approach to make sure that if the ovarian cancer can be detected at this stage in primary care, it is done so. Um, many thousands of you have joined us in this campaign. You've signed our calls to actions. Many of you have written to decision makers um, in your nation to call for this. And we're really excited that we think we can get this change over the line um, in the next sort of 12 to 18 months because NICE, the body who makes the guidelines, um, are due to review the ovarian cancer guideline. Um, it has been a bit delayed because of the pandemic, but we're hopeful that review um, at some point in the near future. And what we really Really need is for you to join with us um, when that time comes um, to make us impossible to ignore if you like on this one so that we can provide the evidence and make it clear how vital that this change is. Moving on to treatment, um, I won't spend a huge amount of time on um, access to cancer drugs because um, anyone that was in Charlie's session this morning will have heard a lot about it from him but um, I think it's fair to say the ovarian cancer treatment has changed hugely, particularly in the last three years, where three different types of PARP inhibitor have become available. Um, and with that, different kinds of genetic and genomic testing. So earlier this year, we had HRD testing or homologous recombination deficiency testing made available in England, Wales and Northern Ireland for the very first time for newly diagnosed women, um, which opened up access to more drug treatment options for them. Um, but we know there's still variation here. So Scotland has a slightly different process for approving drugs which means there can sometimes be differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK. And historically, how drugs were um, approved has meant that there are certain treatments, um, in particular, many of you have heard of bevacizumab, um, where eligibility is very different across the UK. And we are going to be campaigning hard to remove that variation. And we also know these treatment options that we talk about and are very excited are obviously for high-grade serous ovarian cancer and we need to see the same level of treatment options become available for those rarer types of ovarian cancer. Um, we do this by engaging with the bodies that uh, approve these drugs, so it's NICE uh, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland follow NICE's decision and it's a body called SIGN um, in Scotland who, oh, sorry, it's not signed, it's the SMC, signed to the guidelines, the SMC in Scotland who make those decisions. So we, whenever drugs are approved, have the opportunity to advocate and make sure that we're presenting the evidence of the, the impact that they will it will have on our community. So um, a huge thank you to the many of you who have shared your experiences with us, um, both of taking new treatments um, or the um, implications of not being able to access new treatments because they really do make the difference in drug approvals. Um, so this is something um, that actually chimes very nicely with Andy's presentation, because one of the things we are also looking at is the access to specialist surgery and expertise um, for anyone diagnosed with ovarian cancer. So you will have seen in Andy's presentation, there is that variation um, across the England at the moment, and we believe it's similar um, across other nations of the UK. So we need to understand why is that happening and what actions do we need to take to ensure that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, this is an area where there is the beginning of some change. So in England in 2019, um, the NHS, uh, which 2019 always feels like a long time ago already, um, the NHS committed that starting with ovarian cancer, they would ensure greater access to specialist expertise and knowledge in the treatment of cancers. And the Scottish Government published a cancer recovery plan earlier this year, so recovery from the pandemic, which recognised the need to be an improvement in access to specialist surgery. So this is an area where we really want to work closely with you, our community, to start to define what that excellent care should look like and start to understand how we can get rid of those variations. The next area to touch on is support. Um, we know just how vital having the right support um, as you go through diagnosis and treatment and beyond is. Um, and our kind of overall aim is that everyone has the access to the right so psychosocial support at the right time and in the right place and in the right way for you. And we recognise that's a really personal thing. Um, there will not be a one size fits all approach to support. But this is an area where we do know the pandemic has had a huge impact. Obviously, the pandemic has impacted right across ovarian cancer diagnosis, care and treatment. But this one in particular, um, when we have surveyed through the pandemic, um, we heard that 20 percent of women were unable to access the same level of care and support as before the pandemic. And 28% uh, of women reported not having the same level of access to their CNS as before the pandemic. Um, those two stats are probably quite linked because if you can't get access to your CNS, you're going to find it quite difficult to access those support services. Um, and over half of women we surveyed said the pandemic period had had a negative impact on their mental health. 
Um, so there's a sort of short term aim and piece of work for us here around making sure that these um, restrictions or difficulty in accessing support services don't continue beyond the pandemic, but support services are continue and are seen as vital as treatment and the diagnostic improvements we need to see. And we also want to, um, like we do with the kind of broader specialist support, uh, specialist surgery and expertise, we want to work with you to start to define what excellence in support needs to look like so that we can make sure we are advocating for exactly the right thing that will serve your needs. So um, one of the things that I've just outlined are kind of all very well and good if we have, but if we don't have the NHS workforce to deliver these, um, we're going to struggle. And um, anyone that has watched or read or even glimpsed at the news lately will be aware that there is a real brewing crisis in the NHS workforce. Um, and we urgently need to see investment in the NHS workforce um, that treats women with ovarian cancer. Um, so that's clinical nurse specialists. We know that under half of clinical nurse specialists don't think their cancer centre has enough nurses to treat the women they look after. Um, and we also know that um, just under half of them are uh, clinical nurse specialists are over 50, so we'll be approaching retirement. So do we have enough staff to replace them once they retire? Um, those of you in the early diagnosis session earlier would have heard um, a lot about the implications of the shortage of GPs. We need diagnostic staff to both take and interpret tests, and we need uh, cancer specialist doctors to deliver that treatment. This is an area where we're working collectively with 19 other cancer charities, because it's not just an issue for ovarian cancer, to call on the government to really provide that investment. And you can see um, from the picture there that um, that's a couple of members of our policy campaign team and lots of other cancer charity reps delivering a blank check to the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, at number 11 Downing Street, as well as a petition of fifth, over 50,000 signatures calling for two quite specific things we're asking for. We want around £200 million additional investment um, to grow the cancer profession by about 49%, which is kind of what we think we need to be by about 2029 to keep pace with demand. And we also want a cancer nurse fund of around 124 million to train the next generation of cancer nurse specialists. So we can know that when the current generation approach retirement age, there's a new generation coming up behind them. Um, many of you will have signed um, the petition that we did and shared and potentially come to our lobby events around this. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and this will certainly be something that we will be coming to you um, with further ask for your support over the next year or so. And just to very briefly wrap up, because I'm conscious of time, um, is I want to just touch on, so that's what we want. Um, how are we going to do this? And um, how can we work together? And there are two areas I wanted to touch on. So the first is we need evidence. Um, we have done uh, three previous iterations of our Pathfinder study, which um, is a series of surveys, including those with a diagnosis, um, that sets out kind of what's currently going on. Um, in the state of ovarian cancer diagnosis, treatment and care. We're about to launch our fourth iteration of that. Um, and in launching in early 2022, there will be a survey um, incoming into your inboxes if you have had a diagnosis um, or over social media. And it would be really useful if you can continue to um, tell us everything that you can, share your experiences and your evidence so we can make sure that when we're talking to decision makers, we're accurately reflecting what's important to you and your experiences. And lastly, and I'm not going to follow on this too much because there is a session coming up um, after this one on campaigning, um, but we need a strong people powered movement behind this. There are many various ways that you can get involved with that from um, signing petitions, taking actions, writing to people, or maybe one day soon coming to events, um, if we ever get back to in-person events, and you'll find lots of details about that on our website in our campaigns toolkit, or um, please do come along to the session after this with the policy campaigns team where we'll tell you a little bit more about that in detail. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. That's a really powerful oversight um, and sharing how we can all get involved in order to make a difference. Um, we now have time for a very short Q&A. Um, so I've been browsing through some of the questions that have been raised in the chat. There are a couple I can answer very quickly. So um, Rachel and Andy, I'm just going to answer those um, before I hand over a couple of questions to you. Um, there was a question around symptoms leaflets in different languages. And yes, our symptoms leaflets are available in 11 different languages and they're on our website. Um, we can post the link to that in the chat. Um, there were also several questions around 
um, research into holistic well-being, complementary therapies, diet and exercise. Um, the ovarian cancer audit feasibility study didn't look into this, but there is some evidence-based um, data and advice on our website. So again, um, Helen will post something on our uh, on the chat to link to our website, but there is information about that on the website as well. Um, now over to you, Andy and Rachel. Andy, you talked about a lot of the data from the pilot um, audit um, and went into um, a brilliant, really useful amount of information around the statistics. I was just wondering from your experience of actually on the front line, what changes do you want to see? that are going to have the biggest impact in terms of then the care for women? Uh, so I, I think um, diagnosing uh, cancer at an earlier time point is, is the critical thing. And um, if we look at the, the differences in outcome for women who are diagnosed uh, because they identify symptoms, um, go to their GP, GP realises this could be not necessarily ovarian cancer, but it could be something serious, arranges the appropriate investigations, does a CO125, arranges the ultrasound or, or does a CT or whatever it is that the GP feels is appropriate, and then, and then refers or does an examination and, and identifies a mass and refers to the rapid access clinic. Women under those circumstances, as a general rule, do really well because um, they're, they're still at a point where they're functioning well at home, they're able to live normal lives and, and even if they've got symptoms, they, they, their performance status is good and they're able to cope with everything that we've got to offer. And we have a lot to offer in terms of chemotherapy, surgery, um, new, new treatments and all the rest of it. Um, conversely, the, um, the women who are diagnosed uh, because they've become so unwell that they are off their feet or they've got a bowel obstruction or they, can, they can't they can get around because they've developed large pleural effusions in their chest, whatever, and they come in through accident emergency and they go to a care of the elderly ward or go to a gastroenterology ward or go to a respiratory ward and then someone thinks ovarian cancer and they come to us, it's very, very much harder to get those women well enough to get onto the treatment pathway and to be able to cope with the treatments. Um, and all, all of the data suggests that it, it and it, ovarian cancer is a bit different to other cancers. People in other, with other cancers, think cervix cancer, we talk about stage as being a critical thing. So we want to diagnose women at stage one, not stage three or whatever. Ovarian cancer is different to that because it very often stage three happens very early in the piece. So it's not so much the stage, it's, it's the performance status, it's the, 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 the amount of time that it's taken to identify the symptoms, get them referred, get them diagnosed, and then get them under treatment that I think is really critical. And that's particularly an issue, unfortunately, that appears uh, for elderly women. Thank you. Um, you touched as well on the fantastic news that um, Target Brain Cancer have been jointly funding the pilot audit and that that has now been taken up to be funded centrally, which is clearly absolutely brilliant approval of all the work that you guys have been doing already. Is there anything you're expecting that's going to be jumping out of that sort of first findings or, or anything you'd hope to be coming out of that in the early findings? Of the national audit? Yes. Yeah, so um, we don't quite know what format the national audit is going to take yet. We're excited that um, they've announced that it will be Wales as well as England, um, but that probably means that the format will be a little bit different to what we've been doing because at the moment the data that we've got we, we couldn't do we couldn't include Wales at the moment because of the the, the, the nature of the format. Um, we'd very much like it to be uh, a full UK audit. Um, I, th I think we're we're still we're still learning from um, how much value we can get from the audit already in terms of uh, demonstrating uh, differences because if you can demonstrate differences and you can identify um, high quality um, care by um, improved outcomes or ex improved access access to treatment or whatever, then we can try and replicate that elsewhere. And we're and I guess we're 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 part way through our journey on that. We're still, for example, exploring in the current um, uh, audit whether, uh, for example, there's a relationship between access to primary care GP patient ratio and 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 outcome survival or access to treatment and a proportion of patients getting treated and, and all of that, that, that those sorts of things are still still emerging but just from the first the, the first two main main reports um, 
it's it's had an incredible impact on uh, on the clinical teams to be able to look at what they're doing and and understand even in their own patches why certain people are not getting to have treatment and how and then the next step is well how can we change that so i mean i, I don't really know where we are, where we're going to be in five years but i think it's quite exciting and i think it, that i'm we really passionately believe that the that uh, it's the data that drives improvement. If you can, if you can demonstrate what's happening and you can understand why there are differences, then you can actually target the, the you know, what the, the the areas for investment and for development, so that you can improve everyone's quality to the very best. That's brilliant. Thank you, um, Rachel. I was all teed up to ask you an exciting question about nice guidelines because I know that you're an absolute expert on nice guidelines. I'm really sorry we're out of time. Um, so perhaps if the individual who raised that question would like to know more, um, please do send uh, uh, the question to the info at targetovariancancer.org.uk email address, and we will get it to Rachel because I know that she has got a lot to say on anything to do with NICE guidelines. Um, we are going to end the session now. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing their expertise and their experience with us today. And thank you so much to all of you for joining us as well. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you found it useful and informative as we move forwards together.